AP Physics Workbook, Unit 3, Circular Motion and Gravitation, Activity F, Horizontal Circles. Read this scenario along with me, please. A police car of mass M moves with constant speed around a curve of radius R. The car is, from your point of view, coming out of the page and is in the process of turning toward the left side of the page. The car is moving as fast as it can without sliding out of control on the flat roadway to respond to an emergency. This maximum safe speed is called v naught. The coefficient of static friction between the car's tires and the roadway is mu sub s. Using representations, part A. The dot at the right represents the car. Draw a free body diagram showing and labeling the forces, not components, exerted on the car as it rounds the corner. Draw the relative lengths of all the vectors to reflect the relative magnitudes of all the forces. Each force must be represented by a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. Let's give this a try. Well, for one, we know that we have weight and normal force acting on the car. So let's go ahead and draw those down. Some arbitrary unit of length. I'm going to say, I don't know, five units. Make sure that the normal force balances the weight in that they are balanced. The force pointing to the left causing the curvature, in other words, the centripetal force, is the friction force, the static friction force, which I'm going to make three units long. You can make it three, you can make it four, you can make it two. Just make sure that the static friction is shorter than the normal force. Part B. Argumentation. Part B1. Suppose the car encounters a wet section of curved roadway so that the, this section of the car has a coefficient of friction less than mu sub s. The maximum safe speed to make this turn is v1. Mark the correct relationship between v0 and v1. Well, this should make intuitive sense. If the roadway is now wet, friction is less. And if friction is less, you cannot take the turn at the same speed. Therefore, V1 should have to be less than V0. <clears throat> Explain your reasoning using physics principles without manipulating equations. This means you may reference equations from the equation sheet, but should not derive an equation for the relationship between mu and normal force. The friction force provides the centripetal force. If there is a smaller mu and the mass remains constant, there will be a smaller magnitude of friction force, changing the direction of motion. So the direction must change slower. If the radius stays the same, then V must be V1 rather must be smaller than V0. Part B2. Suppose the police car arrives at another section of roadway that curves but has the same radius of curvature, but has a radius of curvature, excuse me, greater than R. The maximum safe speed to make this turn is V2. V2, mark the correct relationship between V0 and V2. Well, if you have a larger turn, a larger turn would dictate that you can take the turn at a greater speed. And thus, yes, V2 would be greater than V0. Explain your reasoning using physics principles without manipulating equations. This means you may reference equations from the equation sheet, but should not derive an equation for the relationship. With a larger radius, the car must go farther to change its direction, the same amount. Therefore, the car can go faster with the same force changing its direction. Part C. Derive an expression for the maximum safe speed the car can make, uh, that the car can turn in terms of uh, mu and r. The net force in the horizontal direction
is equal to mass times acceleration. In this case, the acceleration is centripetal acceleration. So net force in the x direction is equal to m a c. a c meaning centripetal acceleration. Next. The centripetal acceleration of the car is equal to the speed squared over the radius. So we're going to substitute AC for V squared over R. Net force is equal to M V squared over R. So we substituted AC for V squared over R. Next step. In this case, the friction force provides that centripetal force. Friction equals mv squared over r. The friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Now we need to substitute for friction. And the normal force also balances the weight. So friction would be mu times normal force, which is mg, and that's equal to mv squared over r. Mass is canceled. And we have mu g equals V squared over R. The maximum car, the maximum speed the car can make the radius R turn with coefficient of friction mu is, when you solve for speed, we would multiply both sides by R and then square root is mu times G times R. Part D. Explain your expression in part C that supports your answer in part B1. A smaller coefficient of friction under the radical makes the right side of the equation smaller, so V must be smaller than before. Meaning V1 on the wet road would be smaller than V0. Part 2, explain how your expression in Part C supports your answer for Part B2. Remember, your answer in Part B2 was that the V2 was greater than V0 because of a larger turn. And R being in the numerator, or rather on the... If the radius gets larger, then the velocity gets higher meaning a larger radius, you can take it at a faster speed. AP Physics 1 Workbook, Unit 3, Circular Motion and Gravitation. Activity G, Mass and the Frictional Force. Read the scenario along with me, please. Consider a coin of mass M is placed on a rotating surface a distance R away from the axis of rotation. The surface rotates with a period T, period, if you recall, is the time it takes to make one revolution. There are some locations on the surface where the coin can be placed and the force of static friction will not allow the coin to slip. At other locations, the coin will slip because static friction is not strong enough to prevent the coin from slipping. The coefficient of static friction between the coin and the surface is mu. 
let's quickly draw a sketch of the forces acting on R. Normal force would be going up on the coin from the surface, weight would be going down, and static friction would be pointing towards the center of the circle. Part A. The dot at the right represents the coin when the coin is at the location shown above in the diagram. Draw a free body diagram showing and labeling the forces not components exerted on the coin. Draw the relative lengths of all vectors to reflect the relative magnitudes of the forces. The force must be represented by a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. Well, we would have weight coming down. And if I've arbitrarily drawn this six units down, then one, two, three, four, five, six units up would have to be the normal force. The friction points to the left and should be drawn shorter than the normal force. Part B. Starting with the equation, friction is less than or equal to mu times normal force. An inequality has been derived that must be satisfied at all times that the coin does not slip on the surface. The derivation has been done for you. You must fill out the annotation to explain each step. Okay, first step, friction is equal to mu times normal force. Static friction is less than or equal to the coefficient of friction times normal force. Next step, the normal force is equal to the weight of the coin. Therefore, we will substitute normal force for mg. Friction is the centripetal force, so we replace static friction with mv squared over r. Masses cancel. Multiply both sides by r so that we can see that the speed depends on the radius. Square root both sides of the equation. And lastly, substitute 2 pi r over t for the speed of the coin. Okay, so let's back up a minute here. I'm going to do this over to the side. If we rewrite it from this point right here, okay, we know that V is equal to 2 pi R over the period T. That's the circumference divided by the period time. Well, if you square everything, then V squared is equal to 4 pi squared R squared over T squared. And if we substitute this in place of v squared, then we get 4 pi r, oops, back that up, 4 pi squared r squared over t squared equals mu, or excuse me, is less than or equal to mu times g times r. And at that point is where you can see one factor of R cancels here and here to give you that relationship. So again, substitute the circumference divided by the period time, 2 pi R over T for the speed of the coin to get the relationship between the coefficient of friction mu and the radius R. Carlos and Blake are trying to predict whether the coin will slip if it is too close or too far from the axis of rotation. The students reason as follows. Blake, I think the coin will slip if it is too close to the axis. It is like a car that takes a turn too tightly. 
the car can slide out of control. There's not enough force if the radius is too small. Carlos, I think the coin will slip if it is too far from the axis. It's like a merry-go-round. If I ride a merry-go-round near the center, then I don't feel much of a force pulling me to the outside. But if I ride near the outside, there is, is a force pulling me away from the axis. For each student statement, state whether the inequality written in Part B provides support for that statement. If so, explain how. If not, explain why not. Ignore whether the student statement is correct or incorrect for this part. Let's take a look at Blake's statement. If R is small, then the equation on the left side, and let's rewrite the equation just so we can reference it. It's 4 pi squared R over t squared is less than or equal to mu times g. That is the inequality that we're referring to. If r is small, then the left side of the equation will be small, meaning the coin is less likely to slip. As it is less than or equal to mu times g. Carlos, on the other hand, If R is too large, then the left side will be large, making it likely that there will not be enough friction to keep the coin uh, in that circle and it would slide off. Part D, state whether the coin will slip when it is too close or too far from the axis. It will slip when it is too far. Angela and Dominique are arguing over how the mass of the coin affects whether it will slip or not. Angela believes that lighter coin is less likely to slip because light coins require less force. Dominique believes the heavier coin is less likely to slip because heavier coins have much greater amount of friction. Using your equation along with other physical principles, explain how the coin's mass uh, affects its likelihood of slipping. Since the mass canceled out, the mass of the coin does not affect whether it will slip. Since the force causes the motion is proportional to the mass, then the force increases in the same way as the resistance to the force. So the motion will be the same independent of the mass. So again, mass cancels, not a factor. AP Physics 1 Workbook, Unit 3, Circular Motion and Gravitation, Activity H, The Rotor Ride. Carlos, Mass M, enters a carnival ride called the rotor. The ride begins to rotate, and once Carlo has reached speed V, the floor drops out and he does not slip. Part A. The dot at the right represents the student on the ride after the floor has dropped out. Draw a free body diagram showing and labeling the forces exerted on the student. Draw the relative lengths of all vectors to reflect the relative magnitude of all forces. Each force must be represented by a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. Well, let's first figure out what these forces are. You have the weight going down. Okay, you do not have normal force going up. Instead, normal force is going into the circle because the surface is right here. What instead, to prevent Carlos from sliding down, would have to be static friction going up. Now, let's go ahead and arbitrarily give the weight. And the weight this time has to balance the static friction. But remember, friction is always less than normal force. So the normal force pushing on the back from the wall pointing to the center of the circle must be greater. So I'm going to draw this vector greater than this one. Derive an equation for the normal force on Carlos after the floor has dropped out. For each line of the derivation, explain what was done mathematically Express your answer in terms of mass, V, and R, and physical constants as appropriate. 
Well, the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we're talking about... in the y direction. So the net force is equal to m a c. The normal force is the centripetal force. So we're going to do two things. We're going to substitute for centripetal acceleration and for the net force. So the normal force is the net force and the centripetal acceleration is mv squared over r. So we made those substitutions right there. Data analysis. On the next ride, Carlo takes a force sensor and places it between him and the wall of the ride and collects the following data about the force from the wall and the speed of the ride. Okay, so when the force is 190, the speed of the ride is 5 Okay. And notice, we need to be reflecting normal force and not just speed, but the square of the speed. So this last column over here is going to be speed squared in meters squared per second squared. So that one would be 25, 64, 100, 144, 225. Which quantity should be graphed in order to yield a straight line whose slope could be used to determine the radius of the ride? Well, if you take the equation we just had, you have to start with an equation. And the equation we had was normal force equals mv squared over r. Okay, to figure this out, you list all variables and constants. Normal force was the variable in the left column. Velocity squared was the variable in the right column. So those were our two variables right there. Mass and radius were constants. So we're going to separate now the, the uh, variables from the constants. And I'm going to divide v squared both sides. So normal force divided by v squared is equal to m over r. The normal force would be my rise in the graph. The V squared would be my run. And mass divided by radius would be the slope of the best fit line. Switching those out would allow you to find the radius of the ride. So part C, what do we need to plot in order to get this particular straight line? Carlos should graph normal force versus speed squared. Okay, let's do this. Normal force versus speed squared. Normal force in newtons. Speed squared in meters squared per second squared. <clears throat> and I can scale this like, let's see, two, four, six, eight, a thousand. Two, four, six, eight. 2,000, and I can scale the bottom one, let's see, 2550, 7500, 150, 200, 250. So we want to be able to plot this data. So the first one is we're going to go almost 200 up 25. Okay, almost 200 up 25 would be right about there. Uh, we're at almost 550. So a little over 500, up 64, I mean, excuse me, over 64. Sixty-four, let's see, this would be 75, so 64 would be right about there-ish. 
and we're looking for 540. <clears throat> so 246, 540 would be, let's see, 5, and then 540, about right there. Yeah, about right there. <clears throat> Puts that data point right about there. <clears throat> Third data point. We're going at almost 900, up 100, 844, over 100, would be right about there. Then we're going to go up over 1,200, up 144. So over 1,200 would be about right there. And then over almost 150. Puts it about right there. Then we're going to go 1850, so almost 1900 and over 225. That would be about right here. So at this point, we now make a best fit line. Kind of treating this point here as kind of outlierish. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and find the slope of this line. Um, now, normally what we would do is, of course, we would find places where the best fit line intersects the axis, but that's going to be kind of tough because it doesn't really intersect the corner of the graph paper boxes very well. So I am going to, I guess, go from this data point to that one. So that would be a rise of, we're going 1850 minus 840 1850 minus 840 would be a rise of 1010 and we have a run of 100 to 225 so that's 125 The slope would be that rise over run. And it's about eight, about 8.1. About 8.1. we can put that right here. I think that's what was supposed to go there. And then part E, the uh, slope calculated in part D, use that to determine the radius. Well, recall that the slope, remember the slope was equal to Carlos's mass divided by the radius. So you need to swap out those two right there. And the radius is equal to Carlos's mass divided by the slope. So Carlos's mass is 50 kilograms and 50 divided by the uh, slope of about 8.1 gets an approximate radius. Let's see, 50 over 8.1, about six point, a little over six meters. So roughly about 6.2 meters. And again, having an exact answer is not really the issue. It's about the process. And so you are given an acceptable range of values that at least should be in the neighborhood of six meters. AP Physics Workbook, Unit 3, Circular Motion and Gravitation.
activity I, the conical pendulum. Read the scenario along with me. Consider a ball of mass big M connected to a string of length L. The student holds the free end of the string, whirls the ball in a horizontal circle with constant speed. The angle between the string and the vertical is theta. So we're talking about this angle right there. The student attempts to whirl the ball faster and faster in order to make the string become horizontal. No matter how fast the student whirls the ball, the string is never exactly horizontal. Part A, 1. The dot represents the ball at the instant it appears in the diagram. So you can see the ball is on the left-hand side of the person as it's making away its around the circle. <laughs> Draw and label the forces exerted on the ball. Draw relative lengths of all vectors to reflect the relative magnitudes of forces. Okay. So you're going to have two forces acting on this ball. You're going to have tension going up the rope at an angle, and you're going to have the weight going down. Let's figure out how long we're supposed to make these. I'm going to draw the weight an arbitrary amount. Let's say, uh, I'll just draw it the whole way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven units down. Now, tension, on the other hand, has to be drawn in a way where you have a component that is also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven units tall, and then so many units over. So we're going to draw the tension looking like that. Now, don't draw the components in there. I'm just giving you a reference. So tension is drawn at the angle. Weight equals mg is drawn straight down. So a very simplified free body diagram. By discussing specific features of your force diagram, explain why the rope cannot become completely horizontal no matter how fast the ball is whirled. Because the gravitational force is pointing down, there must always be some vertical tension, vertical component of tension to keep the ball in vertical equilibrium. Whirling the ball faster increases the horizontal component of the tension, but with vertical, with any vertical component, the tension can never be completely horizontal. So what this basically means is this. Since there is a vertical section of uh, the weight going down, there has to be some vertical component of the tension going up. Now the horizontal component goes as a centripetal force to the center of the circle. But this component of tension has to balance the weight. Since there is always going to be a vertical component of tension, you can never have a perfectly horizontal rope. You're never going to have a tension going perfectly horizontal like that. And if you think about it, that should make sense. Because if the weight of the, the ball is going down, something has to balance it. And that something would be the vertical force of tension. Part B, one, derive an equation that relates the speed of the ball in its circle to the length string L and angle theta. In the vertical direction, forces are balanced. So what this means is net force, net force in the Y direction equals ma in the y direction but that's equal to zero so really the net force in the y direction is equal to zero okay now the way we describe this usually in class was by saying forces going up equal and balance the forces going down In the vertical direction, the vertical component of tension balances the weight. Now, I'm going to draw a picture over to the side so we can see what's going on here with components. So you've got the tension. 
going up. You've got the weight mg going down. You're going to have a horizontal component and a vertical component. This was the angle made with the vertical. That's the same as this angle here, which makes this vertical component t times the cosine of the angle. Cosine, because that's the adjacent side of tension. The other is the opposite side, which is t sine theta. So this force must balance this force. t cosine theta equals mg. <laughs> solve for tension. Well, we solve for tension by dividing cosine theta, and tension is equal to mg over cosine theta. <laughs> In the horizontal direction, the net force was equal to ma. So the net force in the horizontal direction is equal to ma, but the a is centripetal. So I'm going to write mac. The horizontal component provides the centripetal force. So the horizontal component of tension, okay? And if we look back at the picture, the horizontal component of tension was the T sine theta. So T sine theta provided the centripetal force. And I'm going to uh, substitute centripetal acceleration for AC. So T sine theta equals MV squared over R. Substitute the value for tension. Remember how tension is equal to MG over cosine? We're going to substitute MG over cosine in place of tension right here. MG over cosine theta times the sine of theta, which is already there, is equal to mv squared divided by r. Mass cancels and sine theta equals, sine theta over cosine equals tangent. So, we're going to cancel the mass, and sine over cosine, we can rewrite it as tangent. So this becomes g tangent of theta equals v squared divided by r. <clears throat> the radius of the circle is L sine theta. Okay, let's go back and take a look at the picture on that one. Okay, so here's the length. I'm not dealing with the tension vector anymore. I'm dealing with the length. There's theta. That is the radius of the circle. And that's also the opposite side of the triangle, which would be L times the sine of theta. So we're going to replace R with L sine theta. G tan theta is equal to V squared over L sine theta. Solve for V. So we're going to multiply both sides by L sine theta and then square root. And we get V is equal to the square root of GL sine theta times tangent of theta. And that's our 
final expression for velocity is a function of the length and the angle. Uh, go ahead and cross out the last two boxes as we do not need them for our derivation. Part two. How does your equation in part B show that the rope cannot become horizontal no matter how fast the ball is whirled? Well, if theta is 90, then the tangent of 90 is undefined. Let's go back to what tangent actually means to make sense of this. Tangent of theta. We're saying we put 90 degrees in there, tangent of theta becomes undefined. Well, tangent is sine of theta over cosine of theta. Now, cosine of 90 degrees, if we put in 90 here, sine of 90 is 1. Cosine of 90 is 0. 1 divided by 0, that's undefined. And undefined mathematically just simply means that the value goes to infinity. So having, having this essentially undefined means the velocity would have to be infinitely large, which is not possible. AP Physics 1 Workbook, Unit 3, Circular Motion and Gravitation, Activity J, Centripetal versus Linear Acceleration. Read the scenario along with me, please. Consider a cone made of material for which friction may be neglected. The sides of the cone make an angle theta with the horizontal plane. Small block is placed at point P. In case one, the block is released from rest and slides down the side of the cone towards the point at the bottom. In case two, the block is released with initial motion such that the block travels with constant speed around this dotted circular path. In case one, is the block, the block is released from rest. Is the block accelerating? Absolutely it is. The block slides down the side of the cone from point P toward the point of the cone. Since there is no friction, the block accelerates down the cone parallel to its surface. In case two, the block is released so that uh, it travels at a constant speed along the dotted circular path. Is the block accelerating? Again, yes. Why is this so? The block has centripetal acceleration pointed towards the center. Part B. Use the diagrams to draw the weight and the normal force and use the grids in order to come up with the proper length. Well, here's what's going on in this one. You've got the weight, and we're going to draw the weight the exact same in both. Just like that. The normal force in case one is going to be a little smaller. It has to balance this component of the weight. This normal force in case two is going to be much larger. It is going to have a vertical component of normal force that balances the weight while the horizontal component of the normal force provides the centripetal force towards the center of the cone. <laughs> Derive an expression for the magnitude of the normal force. Well, in case one, <laughs> you have forces going up our forces going up equal forces going down. Therefore, if you looked at the picture, you have normal force going this way, weight going that way. Here's your components. This component here is mg cosine of theta opposite the normal force, and those two must balance. So normal force is equal to mg cosine of theta for just a regular object sliding down an inclined plane. Now in case two, it's a little different. 
Here you wanted your vertical axes to go out of the plane, your horizontal axes to go down the plane. Here you want your horizontal axes to go, well, towards the center of the circle, and your vertical axes remain straight up and down. So here's your little sketch. We've got the normal force. We've got the weight. You have a vertical component. This is going to be the same as the angle of incline. Here's your angle of incline, theta. That is the same as the angle, and those two are vertical angles. This is the adjacent component that makes this normal force cosine of the angle. And this component here would be normal force sine of the angle. So what we see here is normal force cosine must balance the weight. Still forces up equal forces down, but from a different perspective. Normal force cosine now balances the weight. Part D. Use the diagrams to figure out why the normal force is greater in case two than in case one. Well, here's what's going on. If you solve for the normal force in case two, it would be mg divided by cosine. Here it's mg times cosine. When you multiply by cosine, cosine of an angle is always going to be less than one. So multiplying by cosine makes the normal force smaller. Dividing by a decimal less than one makes the normal force larger. Let's summarize this. In case one, normal force balances the perpendicular component of weight, which is n equals mg cosine theta. In case two, the vertical component of normal force that would be n cosine theta, balances the weight. Thus, n cosine theta equals the weight. Solving for n, we get n equals mg over cosine theta. Since mg is multiplied by cosine theta in case 1, normal force will be smaller. In case 2, we divide mg by cosine theta, so the normal force is larger. The normal force is greater in case 2.